Welcome and thank you for coming to the first of the School of Photovoltaic and Renewable Energy Engineering Lectures for 2021. It's my great pleasure today to introduce you to Scientia Professor Martin Green, who needs little introduction. Martin is the Director of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics and the recent winner of the prestigious Japan Prize. Today, Martin will talk to us about, today about recent trends in photovoltaics. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Renata. Uh, so as Renata mentioned, I'm Martin Green from UNSW Sydney. And today I'd just like to uh, give an update on what's been happening in photovoltaics. And plenty has been, as you'll see. So uh, I've got five parts to the talk. I'll try to get through all of them, although I might have to go a bit quickly at the end. But the first one is just looking at some of the big picture developments. So I guess the biggest thing that's happened in photovoltaics over the last dozen years or so is the reduction in cost. So last year they did drop to um, 17 US cents a watt for um, uh, average wholesale selling price. And a uh, little bit of a rise towards the end of the year because of a shortage of glass and polysilicon, but expected to drop well below that 17 uh, by the end of this year. If you plot that um, cost reduction on a logarithmic graph, you tend to get things that are pretty straight lines. And uh, that just means that the costs are reducing exponentially. And the exponential reduction rate is, you know, 20% compounded every year. And this is going back over, well, since 2012, which is the more stable part of that um, earlier graph, the linear graph that I just showed. So the other big thing that's happened is that um, while for many years polycrystalline back surface field technology was the dominant one, just recently, as we'll see, PERC's taken over. So I've got PERC also shown there. And the gap between it and polysilicon is sort of closing as we go along. You can see the little uh, blip up towards the end of the year with due to those shortages I mentioned. Um, but every expectation is that rate of decrease will continue at least for the next few years. So we're looking at something like 10 cents a watt for the modules by about 2023 is my prediction. Uh, so last year, the International Energy Agency, who haven't been too keen on photovoltaics, and even now are fairly conservative in their PV projections, um, they had a bit of a turnaround and uh, they declared that solar is now the cheapest source of electricity in most countries, which is correct, and um, now offers some of the lowest cost electricity ever seen. So that's quite a, quite a nice, strong statement. But the thing is, you know, we haven't stopped reducing prices. So even though now we're at some of the lowest prices ever seen, there's a lot more to go in terms of cost reduction. So someone described the era that we're going to enter, you know, probably over this decade, will be insanely cheap costs for photovoltaics. So we're enter entering an era of insanely cheap photovoltaic costs. Um, these reducing costs are driving up the volume, so that's going exponentially as well. Another semi-logarithmic plot here. So last year, according to um, uh, PV Tech, there was 145 gigawatts of photovoltaic photovoltaics installed. I think Bloomberg's coming out with a similar figure. So uh, it might even go a bit higher before the dust settles. So PV Tech's projecting 190 for this year, 250 for the year after, and then um, they think it can get to 900 by the end of the decade. So if you um, do an optimistic projection, you get us getting to uh, one terawatt a year manufacturing, uh, photovoltaics manufactured each year by the middle of the decade. And uh, you know, a more conservative plot, these um, market analysts have to be a little bit conservative because it's easier to explain when things go better than projected rather than when things go worse. Um, but, you know, so there is a um, uh, well-considered expectations that we'll reach that terawatt level sometime over this coming decade. And um, that means a great, you know, substantial expansion in manufacturing capacity. So this is a um, chart prepared by PV InfoLink, is it, that's shown there? I can't quite read it on the screen. But um, they're just showing, you know, announced capacities, what everyone's expected to be, I guess, you know, by the end of this year or maybe early next year. But you can see that um, 
uh, some of the companies are getting to quite high capacity. So Tongwei is going to be at 50 gigawatts capacity, you know, within the next year, I would say these projections are relating to AK Sol at 40. So we're entering a new era of these massive capacities. Many companies, you know, 30 um, gigawatts and, and above. So to reach that terawatt, um, you know, a handful of these manufacturers will have to be over 100 gigawatts capacity you know, some maybe 200 gigawatts, but that type of capacity with the growth that we're seeing in capacity looks quite realistic. So it doesn't seem like a huge um, projection from, the, from what we're seeing. So that's probably some of the leading players. So a few new names creeping in there as well as the regulars. So big uh, con continued growth over the next decade. And the next two years, everyone thinks is more or less guaranteed because of the backlog that's been caused by the shortages in the glass and the polysilicon. So everyone's quite confident over the growth over the next two years. And after that, depends on a lot of factors, I guess. So the significant significance of that one terawatt is shown in this graph here. So um, shows actual CO2 emissions up to 2014. This is just the best chart I've seen demonstrating all the issues involved. And then one of these projections that keeps you below two degrees centigrade. So when I saw this, which was 2015, I guess, <laughs> I got a bit despondent because you can see, you know, despite the best efforts of the four biggest emitters there, we're going to run into a real problem by the end of this decade in that they'll have consumed the whole budget for a two degree centigrade rise. So it looked a bit impossible then, but with that recent surge in photovoltaics, with the reducing costs and increasing production and so on, it now looks quite realistic that we can reach that one terawatt somewhere over the decade. And uh, the little arrows there, this up on the right hand side, just sort of show what one terawatt will do in reducing CO2 emissions if it's displacing coal from electricity generation or oil from transport. So it can have a significant impact. So year after year, it'll put you on pretty much the correct trajectory to, um, you know, to follow that um, projection. So uh, it's given a hope for um, re um, reducing CO2 emissions on a time, in a timely manner. And I, th and I think things will, will escalate rather than slow down. Okay, this next part, Perk takes over the in industry. So these are just some recent charts. I've been attending more conferences this year than ever before in my life, I think, but all virtual ones. But this is um, from PV Tech again, Finlay Convul. Uh, but it just um, showing the composition of the um, cell production over you know, the last eight years or so. So the dark blue is the aluminium black surface field, polycrystalline. Um, the yellow is perk polycrystalline, the red is BSF mono, and the khaki brown is perk mono, and then uh, black is n-type, and blue is thin film. So you can see, um, over, you know, since 2014, I guess, perk sort of first started appearing on this chart, and by 2020, it's taken over the majority of the production. So PV Tech says over 90% of production last year was PERC. So that's a new update. We were saying 85, but it looks like it was a bit more than that. And uh, this year, they're expecting it to be 95% of production. So uh, polycrystalline is just about completely wiped out, except for a couple of production lines in India who are, who, um, are committed to that technology. So N-type share decreasing over this year at least. Um, if you plot that in terms of absolute quantity, you can see the numbers here. So, um, you know, as I said, 145 terawatts in 2020 produced, mainly PERC, and then in 2021, 190 or so. But um, the surprising thing about this is that with all this exponential growth, if you just look at those khaki brown areas and the yellow, you can count them as well, and a bit of the black because N-type PERT is included in that. Um, the total amount of PERC that will be produced sometime around the end of this year or early next year will be higher than the amount of photovoltaics produced from all other technologies over the history of photovoltaics. So it's really quite remarkable when you think about that. So we'll surpass 
one gigawatt sometime uh, uh, accumulated capacity, you know, sometime late this year or early next year more likely, but over 500 megawatts of that, over 500 gigawatts of that, of that one terawatt will be um, perk. So um, yeah, more perk installed than anything else, despite the fact it's only been around for a few years. So you know, one of the features of exponential growth, I guess, it was quite mind boggling when I reflected on that. Oh yeah, I just put that in there in writing just to remind me. Um, so uh, it's been a combination of two things, you know, the higher efficiency and then uh, Lungi has been particularly effective in reducing the cost of, um, of silicon wafers. So just, this is just a chart from one of their recent talks, a little bit small, I'm sorry, but what they're doing now, they're pulling uh, four big ingots from each crucible. They recharge it, those little um, straws going into that container, dribbling polysilicon in while the crystal's growing. So you can grow multiple um, ingots from the one crucible. And uh, um, now they're doing one and a half tons of silicon per crucible. So, you know, a massive improvement from 60 kilograms when they started. So a massive Im increase in throughput that they're showing there. And then the other big development's been with the wire saw sawing that it's taken up. So the little chart on the right, you probably can't really read the figures, but it starts in 2011, goes up to 2019, but it just shows the red shows the wafer slicing cost has reduced by a factor of five and the um, Ingot pulling cost has reduced by a factor of five as well. So that corresponds to about 20% a year compounded uh, reduction. Um, so the wires have got thinner by 50%. The, um, the kerf loss has reduced, so you're getting 40% 40, 40 more wafers per unit length. And the cutting speed has gone up 65%. So, you know, massive improvements in the, in the soaring. So that's been part of the reason that PERC has done so well. Um, apart from offering higher efficiency, um, PERC has other attributes as well. So that was the main driver was the higher efficiency being offered, but uh, other things are flowing from the transition to PERC. So one is that for the first time it offers a cheap bifacial cell. So you could do it in the past, but it was uh, you know, an expensive option. But now that it's cheap, I, I think all the PERCs cells being manufactured now as, are manufactured as bifacial cells because it doesn't cost any more and then they either go into a monofacial or bifacial module. So that'll, um, that gives you extra energy for free. So that's at least a 5% gain without doing anything too spectacular and you can get up to 20% if you take a bit of care, you know, having, you know, reflective, you know, white painted backgrounds or white stones in the background or something like that. So that's been um, one thing that's taken off in parallel with PERC has been bifaciality, which has added to the cost reductions. The first commercial sales of PERC were actually for this solar car back in 1996, and we used shingled half-cut cells. And uh, the industry sort of caught on to that idea, you know, just after PERC was taken up. So um, that's what everyone started doing was half-cutting cells and uh, shingling although some people didn't like shingling, so other methods, other um, tiling methods to allow the cells to be packed more closely. So shingling is shown on the left there, and then um, to the right of that is shown Longi's method where they squish the, the wire has a triangular shape where it goes over the bus bar to uh, reflect light onto the cell, and then it gets squished down in the region between the cells, flattened out so that it, um, you can have the cells more closely spaced together. So there's a variety of other techniques that manufacturers are using to give them closer spacing. So bifaciality, closer packing, and um, uh, bigger cells. So for a long time, well, the 156 wafers were introduced um, in around 2012, and uh, they, they give about 10 amps output. So people really didn't want to handle too much more current than that because that means you need more copper to um, carry the current out. So people were sort of stuck with that size because it you know, was a good compromise in terms of current and so on. But just in 2019, um, there's a bit of a jump in size to this 166 size. I think Longi spearheaded that. And then more recently to 182 and 210. So at the moment, there's a big battle going on between 210 wafers and 182. 
but the thing that allowed people to think about these larger wafers was the realization you could cut them into half and uh, yeah, you actually got benefits from that like reduced resistance losses and there's better shadow tolerance and hot spot performance and so on so there was a number of uh, flow-ons from um, cutting the cell into half that may not have been uh, expected beforehand but um, uh, you know allowed you go these bigger waves because the you know, it, it helped keep the current each cell was generating down to reasonable levels. So that just gives a more direct comparison of a 156 and a 210 wafer. And the, you can see the 210 wafer in this case. Oh, I hope you can see it. You may just be able to see it's, it's designed for cutting into three. So you don't have to cut into two, you can cut into three, or I think Sun Power is cutting into eight or nine. So for a long time, uh, photovoltaics lagged behind the microelectronics industry. So a bit of a timeline along the bottom, although it gets squished up towards the end. Um, but that just shows the evolution of wafer size and microelectronics in, in red. So 12 inch or 300 millimeters was introduced around the turn of the century. Um, for a long time, photovoltaics has dealt with smaller wafers because of this uh, current issue. But now you can chop them up just over the last, since 2019, there's been this uh, jump, you know, substantial increase above 156, sort of incremental increases initially and now big jumps because of the chopping up. So microelectronics was, um, you know, prior to going to 300 was increasing the wafer size every 10 years or so. So when the 300 got introduced, or the 12 inch, uh, it was expected that another 10 years you'd go to 450 and then another 10 years after that you'd go to the 675. So that was sort of the expectation, 10 year upgrade in uh, wafer costs because that inc increases the, that lowers the cost per chip by, um, you know, increasing the throughput per machine and all that kind of stuff. But the, the, the real problem in microelectronics has been with the uh, lithography, you know, because everyone wants smaller and smaller dimensions and doing it over larger and larger area at the same time is pretty challenging. So the cost of the photolithography uh, hasn't scaled with the wafer size uh, as might have originally, as it did with smaller wafers, I guess. So um, the trans, uh, transferal to the um, 450 wafer has been deferred. So the latest uh, roadmap said about 2029, that transition's expected. But however, um, photovoltaics doesn't have that same issue with photolithography. So I'm just sort of thinking with all this interest in big wafers, someone might get the idea of, of uh, jumping ahead of microelectronics and going to larger wafer sizes. And I'll show you know, a couple of slides on that there's very good reasons for going to bigger wafers. So we might go to, um, like I think something like a 15 inch wafer would be a good size for photovoltaics for a reason I'll explain. But um, yeah, so m from now on, we might, m might actually get ahead of microelectronics rather than trailing behind in terms of wafer size. So bigger wafers mean bigger modules. So these have grown. So only a couple of years ago, 300 watts was a really powerful module. Now you've got to be able to over 600 watts to get any attention. So growing quite big as you can see from the scale of that six foot tall guy there. So what's determining module size? And it's quite interesting, some of the issues that are coming up, but it's really the size of a shipping container that's going to determine the module size and maybe even the cell size ultimately. So this is just a new range that's been released by uh, Trina. So uh, they, they've been the, the champion of the 210 millimeter wafer and Longji has been the champion of the 182. So there's two different camps battling it out. So, uh, you know, I think the 210 should win, you know, the bigger, bigger the better. But some of the issues are, are apparent in that slide at the left hand top there. Um, that shows um, Trina's 210 wafer repertoire in terms of the modules they're offering. So they've got one for residential rooftops, like one that one person can carry and that's the that's the one on the left there, so high efficiency and all dark in this case. And then they've got um, two skinny looking modules, tall and skinny, and then two fatter looking ones. So the biggest one is a, a 670 watt module. So that's over three square meters, 21.6 um, efficient to get to the, to get to the 670 watts. Um, but you can see the, the two in the middle 
Um, actually, you have five cells across. So, you know, that's to get, you know, wafers, modules have typically been a metre in one direction. So to get that sort of metre dimension with 210 millimetre wafers, you, you know, you only fit five in. And um, uh, you notice that white band uh, in the middle of the module, and that's to get the return because um, no, if you have an even number of cells across, you can, you can just um, connect them to the same, I guess, line across the module that they started from. But if you have an odd number, you have to get the polarity back to that, um, to that connection. So that, that's what that white region is. That's an isolation zone for the return tabbing to take, you know, to, to, get, to connect it. So obviously there's the extra cost and loss of efficiency and everything associated with that. So a good idea to have an even number of cells across the module. So if you're using 15 inch um, wafers rather than 12 inch to, to cut out your, um, your, your starting wafer for photovoltaics, you'd, um, you'd be able to fit four across there. So you get rid of that white strip. So that's one kind of thinking that might guide the um, increase in wafer size in future. So the ones on the right have um, six uh, cells across, so they don't have that problem, so they, they don't need that return, only if you have an odd number. So that's one thing that's going to determine the wafer size. And then uh, if you look at the drawings on the right, um, this is how the modules are packed to, to uh, ship it, to put into a um, container for shipping you know, internationally and around the countryside or whatever. So the containers are a standard size, thank goodness. Um, they're, they're about 40 foot, high, 40 foot long, and about eight foot wide and eight foot high in the old units, which, which um, uh, dominate in the container business. Um, but uh, as you can see at the bottom there, you really want to fit a nice even number of packaged modules into the container. So that's one constraint on the size of the modules. And then the two methods that are being used to uh, ship the modules, the one on the um, left uh, showing two, two cartons of modules, two packages of modules stacked on top of each other, that's the way it's normally been done. So if the modules are less than about 1.1 metre in width, you can stack these two cartons within the eight foot that you've got within a size of container and have room for the uh, uh, pallets and the um, you know, a bit of clearance to get them in and out and so on. So that, you know, so that works well with packing them densely in a pallet. But if you um, go to anything wider than that, you've probably got to do it the other way that's shown on there on the right. You, you, you can't lay the modules down when you're transporting them because that encourages breaking, breakage and mi micro cracks and everything. So um, you, you can't have them lying flat on the bottom of the container. You have to have them sort of sitting on one of the sides. So the other way shows the way that Trina is exploring. So with that big module that's 2.384, that's getting close to eight feet. So you just sort of stand the modules upright within the, within the container. And they sort of show um, you know, a fully packed container down the bottom um, right hand corner there. So um, making very good use of container space. So their punchline is that they can squeeze 12% more modules into a container you know, largely because they've avoided the extra pallet that involves in the first approach with the side on. So that's another issue, you know, like thinking about module sizes, how many can you fit into a, into a container is one thing the manufacturers obviously are thinking about quite carefully. The um, number you can put in the other direction, the direction into the uh, screen, depends upon the frame size. So everyone's working towards, um, what would you call them, <laughs> not narrower frames, but uh, frames that have got less um, depth in that direction. Um, so you can squeeze more modules into a package. So um, these big modules have a 40 millimetre depth in that direction for the frame, so you can't space them any closer than 40 millimetres. But uh, some of the smaller product screeners now are using 35, and that helps improve that density. So um, that's the type of consideration that's uh, going into it. And Trina, um, to encourage use of their modules, they have developed their own tracker. So there's a tracker designed for these big modules. And 
they're in the process of developing their own equipment for um, automatic handling of the modules. So generally the modules are dragged out of the package by two people and then carried over maybe to another two, team of another two who actually install the module onto the tracker. Yeah, you can see, um, but, but Trina are working with this concept down the bottom where you use sort of glass handling technology to reduce the number of people you need to unload one of those packages. So um, if you start doing that, if you start using machines to handle the modules rather than people, you can obviously go to even bigger and heavier modules down the track. So maybe that's a direction we'll see things progress as well. So this is one of those Trina modules and you can see the big white stripe down the long direction in the middle. And uh, that means it's got five cells across. Uh, so that um, module, um, the main constraint at the moment is, is, is on the weight of the module. The, you know, the size is constrained by the weight because there's a limit that two people are allowed to lift you know, through OH and S standards in different countries and so on. So everyone's trying to keep the weight of the module below 40 kilos. So this one here is only 29, so it makes it easy. It's, it's a 550 watt module, I think. Um, but the really big one weighs 30, 34 kilos, the biggest one I showed there. So you're starting to get quite heavy. But if you go any bigger than that, it becomes too difficult to handle. So gone are the, are the days when one person can handle a module easily. Um, two people are needed now. Uh, and, and most manufacturers are now introducing special rooftop modules for, that people can carry up a ladder or something if they really had to. Okay, and this is a slide from uh, a decade or more ago, but um, Applied Materials it was introducing these large amorphous silicon panels around that e era, and uh, they were um, close to six square meters and weighed 100 kilos, so too, too heavy to conveniently handle. Um, so uh, this sort of automatic installation equipment was developed around then for installing. So that's another approach slightly different from the one that uh, Trina seems to be exploring. So uh, yeah, so maybe that's what we're looking at, it going to even bigger and bigger modules. How big can you go? This is a 40 foot container, but you could have a, a module that was 40 foot by eight foot and still fit it into that. So um, that's probably as big as you can realistically go. So with um, PERC, that would generate uh, over six kilowatts, maybe seven kilowatts by the time you got to that size. So um, that, that means you could do a lot of things in the factory, all the, you know, all the interconnection between subunits and power conditioning and everything could be done at the six kilowatt type level and then these shipped to the field and just plonked into place and connected via a single cable or whatever. So, um, you know, the, the thing driving the increased module size is reduced um, balance of systems costs you know, for large installations in particular. Okay, next part of the talk, uh, what comes after PERC? Uh, this is a vexing question. Um, and these are contending technologies. So you've got uh, PERC and, and N-type PERT is, a, is the N-type counterpart that works best. And you've got uh, TopCon, which is um, has a tunneling rear contact, polysilicon, tunneling oxide polysilicon contact, I guess it stands for. Uh, it's a bit of a misleading acronym because you th tend to think of it on the top, but it's really on the back of the cells that it's being used. There's, then there's the heterojunction. So this is shown with the polarity, and you probably can't see the labeling there, but you know, um, Panasonic with their heterojunctions, they had a P-type amorphous silicon at the top, intrinsic N-type wafer, N-type um, N-type amorphous silicon at the back. Um, so that's the normal way of doing it, junction at the top, etc. But um, the P-type apparently isn't all that stable. So under illumination, uh, if you see field data from the Sanyo panels, you'll, you'll see them losing voltage. So they had this additional degradation mechanism normal silicon panels don't have. So the way to overcome that is to flip the cells over and have the N at the top. So that's what most manufacturers that are looking at heterojunctions are doing now. So it's really a, a back surface field, a uh, back surface junction device in that you have your, you have your N 
N plus, N, P plus type of structure. And then you've got the IBC, which has got both junctions on the back. And the chart there on the left just shows the history of the evolution of the different technologies. So uh, all of these have now got 25% and beyond. So most of them over 25 have been the rear junction approaches, although with the TopCon now in, in small cells has got up to 26%. Uh, interestingly, with a P-type substrate rather than the um, N-type. Also with an inverted structure with the junction on the rear of the device. So the, it uses um, the same polarity contacting as for the N-type wafers, but just has the contact on the back. So um, you can see that uh, although um, well, all, the, all those technologies were originated uh, about the same time, even TopCon, as I'll show on the next slide. Or oh, maybe I'll go to that. The first TopCon was actually made here at the University of New South Wales up in the ELEC Engineering Building in late 1981. So we um, were looking at that because we were working on tunneling metal insulator semiconductor and the problem there was the metal would react with the oxide if you heated it above you know, 300 degrees or something or other, you're very likely to short out the tunneling contact. So we were working on polysilicon as a way of overcoming that and got quite good results as you can see on the chart on the right there. We were working on voltages at the time trying to um, get, a, get over 700 millivolts was our target and we nearly got there in 82. But um, we made our first TopCon in 81 and we got over 660 millivolts, which was way better than anyone else in the world was doing, apart from us with our metal contacts. Somehow or other, Fraunhofer missed this paper when they reported on their TopCon, although it was fairly widely cited in the literature at the time. Uh, anyhow, going back to the spiel, uh, all of these have a similar length of a history but if you look at the uh, commercialization attempts, actually the heterojunction and the IPC have had a lot more serious work put into them than the PERC, in that uh, you look, there's about a 10 year gap between the two. So my theory has always been the PERC will catch up because in the laboratory, when we were sort of on a level playing field, we could always beat IBC and heterojunction. So why not in industry? So I, you know, I've been a bit reluctant to believe that um, uh, PERC can't match um, the other technologies and efficiency. It's just this delay in terms of the industrial take up of the technology that, um, you know, that has um, caused the difference, you know, because um, uh, both IBC and um, HJT has had 15, 20 years of commercialization. So the advantage of going to N-type, well, well the, the thing I should mention is that um, the PERC and the TopCon are quite rugged technologies in that they can tolerate material that isn't perfect um, because you, know, you just lose a bit of current and um, neither of them is a higher voltage as a heterojunction, for example. So you, you, know, you might lose a bit of current, perhaps a little bit of voltage. But with the um, heterojunction, the advantage only comes through voltage. So you, you need a high open circuit voltage to get the efficiency advantage because the the current gets reduced by the absorption in the uh, ITO, which is a conducting semiconductor, and the um, transparent conducting semiconductor, and the, um, and the amorphous silicon, which is made very thin to decrease the absorption, but it still absorbs a bit. So you're always going to have lower current from a heterojunction than from a, a PERC or TopCon. So the only way you can get the efficiency advantage is through voltage. So to get the voltage, you need to have really good material. So you, you really puts new pressure on the quality of the n-type wafers. But if you have a good n-type wafer, you can get good voltages and that gives you, a, you know, you, and you can get a higher efficiency. Um, you can get a lower temperature coefficient. The closer the open circuit voltage is to the band gap, the lower the temperature coefficient. And you get good bifaciality because, you know, you need this good material. So it's going to be able to collect carriers right across its thickness. So um, yeah, and as I said, it doesn't matter if you flip, flip the heterojunction over, that's essentially what's happening in production now. They're being used upside down to overcome the stability issue with the, the P-type amorphous silicon. Um, so uh, you need really good uh, quality. And then for the IBC, you need uh, 
very good quality for a different reason. So most of the carriers are actually generated within the first micron or so of the top surface. So they have to find their way over to the back. And if you, if you just had a planar collector along the back, if, you, um, if your diffusion length was any less than 10 times the wafer thickness, you'd lose 1% of your carriers. So where you've got these small target areas for the carriers to get to on the back, you need diffusion lengths that are even greater than 10 times the wafer thickness. So you need really good quality material for a different reason. So th these two structures aren't as robust. They're really dependent upon good quality material. But if you have the good quality material, they can give those advantages. So um, I gave a similar talk to this, one of the first in the series, which started about 10 years ago. And um, I was talking about the future and the ITRPV roadmap was showing this transition to N-type, you know, occurring over the next few years. So a very similar situation to today. And I sort of poo-pooed the idea in my talk. I think it's on the website actually, but I said, well, that's not going to happen. But um, we're in a similar situation now. So this is the um, international uh, roadmap, technology roadmap for PV. So it shows um, everyone's a winner, I guess, because you know, even though uh, some of the shares of the market is going down, the market itself would be growing. So everyone's growing according to this scenario, apart from BSF, which got chopped out even more quickly than anticipated here. So um, PERC, um, uh, loses market share to the N-type technologies is essentially what that's showing. A gradual transition though. Um, this is Fraunhofer's take on it. So um, BSF um, bottoms out at 20% efficiency, PERC bottoms at 23.5, passivating contact. So I guess that's Topcon or, um, or heterojunction goes to uh, 25. And then I think that BJBC I'm trying to figure out what that stood for, but I, I guess that's a rear junction device, which uh, they're saying will get to 26. So that's all, sort of their mo roadmap with a bit of a timeline across the bottom there. Um, but at, at a recent um, conference, PV, tech, het, PV Hetero Junction Tech, I think it was called, um, uh, Finlay Col Colville from uh, PV Tech, who's got very strong opinions and generally quite good ones, he, he figured that the transition to N-type was going to occur sometime over this decade, and it wouldn't be slow, it would be an avalanche like happened with PERC. So this is, a, the original plot was from PV Tech, and this is his extension of it over the coming decade. So PERC rules, 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 with N-type not doing much at all, maybe even decreasing in market size, market share, and then all of a sudden everything comes together and the N-type takes over. So he was diplomatic and gave about half to Topcon and half to uh, Heterojunction. So that was his, his take on things. Um, what else? Are, what are other people saying? This is um, someone's forecast, well, documentation of N-type capacity up to 2018 and then forecast beyond that of what was likely to happen. So it just shows the contenders. So. IBC down the bottom, heterojunction, and this is PERT, PERT technology. So PERT was right up there amongst them, at least until 2018. And then um, this uh, crowd, PV Infolink, saw the heterojunction starting to take off and, uh, and grow. Although this, is, um, uh, this capacity is quite small to the total installed capacity that was expected to anticipate. So uh, uh, in anticipated to be installed at that time. So still um, uh, staying small. And this is uh, PV Tech's take on what actually happened. So uh, they've lumped them together. So heterojunction and IVC along the bottom. So they've stayed pretty stagnant in terms of their production, actual production amount. And I've just got the little arrow there to remind you that we're talking about that little black region there. So that's how that, that is broken down. Um, so, uh, Heterojunction and IBC has stayed pretty constant rather than shooting up as the other crowd thought. And then the one that has shot up is PERC and Topcon, largely through the uptake of Topcon by uh, Jollywood, I guess, has been the major player there. So it hasn't quite gone as planned, but one of the passivating technology, uh, passivated technology contexts has come through. 
there was a couple of talks by the companies that were involved in actually um, making heterojunction. So Ginergy has uh, operated a 100 megawatt line for a while and just recently started a second 100 megawatt line. So this is just all the companies that have been interested in heterojunctions over the, since 2010. Sanyo from way back before then. Um, but uh, Ginergy is up there, you can see with 200. And Ryzen is the other one who is supposed to have two and a half gigawatts capacity. So this is uh, capacity that is installed. And then there's Shanxi Coal, who I hadn't heard of, is supposed to be putting in one gigawatt. And Tongwei are putting in one gigawatt. But we noticed they had um, uh, 50 gigawatt total capacity on the other slide. So it's not a huge amount of their production. So uh, you know, I'm just wondering whether there's interest in N-type. N-type is a case of the grass being greener on the other side, which is shown in that little inset there. So this is what Ginergy reported. So they reckon their present costs are at 38% higher than PERC, so not really competitive. So they're, you know, they're not really making money from their lines, although there is a specialty market for high efficiency products, although I, I doubt theirs are too much effic more efficient than PERC. But this is just their strategy for reducing down to the cost of perk. So the big one here is uh, silver paste, because you require a lot more silver paste in, in, in all the N-type technologies, but particularly in the uh, heterojunction. Um, but one thing Ginergy were forgetting was that this isn't static. The perk costs are going to come down over this period. So you've got to even work even harder than you thought to, um, to have a competitive product at the end of that developmental period. Um, Ryzen did a very good talk. They concentrated on the problems <laughs> with the heterojunction technology. And one of them that has been reported before with N-type technology is getting, you know, as I said, with, with the heterojunction, you need really good quality to get the performance advantage. And if you looked at the Sandy, the Sanyo product literature, the product efficiencies were always a lot lower than their um, record cells. You know, and that was because the ingot quality isn't uniform along the length. So Ryzen were just complaining about that. They said, we can't get good enough ingots from our suppliers. So um, you know, we, we have this problem with the quality varying along the length, and we can't maintain high efficiencies along the length. So they were calling for better control of ingot quality. And then I just sort of noticed this. Um, PV Insights, who give weekly spot prices. This is last week's data. but. N monograde 12N, 12N plus. So the normal P type N, 9N, 9N plus. So for N type, they're thinking that you might need 12N to get the really good quality. But what that happens if the manufacturers can make this 12N plus, you'll be able to use it for the P type material as well. You might even be able to get some of the oxygen out of the P type material. So you, you, you may be able to. Um, improve the p-type performance or well, you're likely to improve the p-type performance through these efforts to get even purer polysilicon and then um, Ryzen also pointed out that you don't get the same benefits from big wafers with heterojunction because you generally load the wafers onto a platen like this and all it means is you can load fewer wafers onto the platen so you get the same area processed um, and that's the most expensive, well, one of the only steps in the heterojunction fabrication is depositing all those amorphous layers. So you're not going to increase the throughput of the equipment. And it's a bit like photolithography, like getting uniform deposition over large areas and everything is what adds cost to that processing equipment. Whereas if you're just diffusing the junctions, just need a bigger tube. So they, they saw going thinner as they, they were going to stick with I think, I think Ryzen had just moved to uh, 166 millimeter wafers, and they were going to stick with those and concentrating on thinning them. From what I understood, what everyone else is going to 210 and so on. So you got the feeling they may get left behind. Okay, part four. I'll have to whisk through this. What comes after PERC long term? You've probably heard this before, so I'll go over it quite quickly. I think tandem's the answer. So um, you know, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this idea, but I'll just mention it for the video. You stack a wider band gap cell on top of silicon. It can convert the high energy photons more efficiently than silicon can. So, and the uh, lower efficiency, lower energy photons pass through to the silicon, so they still get converted at about the same rate by silicon. But the combination by specialising on the different photon 
energies, you can get an overall improvement in efficiency. Uh, and this is how much you can get. And it also shows that silicon's a good choice for the bottom cell, at least if you're only stacking three cells together. So the, the, on the right, just shown the limits. So I think PERC will get to 25% in production, the same as we did in the lab. All the other technologies have done better than the lab performance, so why not with PERC? And uh, if you can get that same fraction of performance with uh, two junctions on silicon, you should be over 40% efficiency at the cell level. And uh, the red just shows that if you did that without silicon, had your ideal materials, um, you know, so silicon's very close to the optimum, even better for a two and three cell stack than for a single cell. But the big issue is um, what material do you stack onto silicon? So ideally, you need to have a material that has all silicon's attributes, abundant, non-toxic, stable, and efficient. And by efficient, it has to be at least over 20% efficient. And uh, I've just made a list there of some of the key contenders. So you've got uh, perovskites, and against those four criteria, I'm just going to tick or cross. So perovskites tick two boxes. It uses uh, abundant materials, at least it could. Most of the high performance cells use gold and so on, but if you uh, uh, can get that out of, the out of the processing, you could do it with abundant materials and you can get higher efficiency. Organics are starting to emerge. Um, so there's been an 18% organic cell made now, so they're probably going to get over the 20%. So they're, they're good in terms of um, non-toxicity and abundance. Stability might be a bit of a question mark and efficiency is not there yet, although I think it'll get there. So organics are worth thinking about again as top cells. And then uh, you've got the um, traditional semiconductors, the diamond or, or silicon like, the semiconductors of the diamond or silicon type structure. Artificial silicon is what I call them. Um, but if you combine uh, the right elements from the periodic table in the right proportions, you can synthesize material where you have this um, uh, you know, the same the silicon crystal structure and similar properties to silicon, except that you want wider band gaps, which is quite easy to get. But if you look at the contenders, um, none of them have uh, four ticks. Uh, CZTS is the uh, closest it's got three, but it hasn't got the efficiency, which is probably the really important one to have the tick against. And then some of the others have problems with stability and toxicity and so on. So no solution. So I think that's one of the big problems facing photovoltaics. Probably the most important one is finding a thin film material that you can stack onto silicon that has those four attributes. You know, efficiency and stability are the two most important ones, but I think in the long term, yeah, well, in the long term, you're obviously going to need abundance and I think you're going to need non-toxicity as well. So um, putting the first cell onto silicon, you've got to do a bit of fiddling around. You need a um, contact a bit like the heterojunction contact, you need TCOs and all that kind of stuff. So you have to do a bit of fiddling around, but all this development of heterojunctions will help you out there. But the second cell is sort of for free. You don't have to do anything more complicated with the contacting. So you may as well stack two cells on silicon if you can get one cell on silicon to work. Um, but what happens is the silicon contribution to the performance goes down with each cell you stack. So if you stack one cell on silicon, you share the photons, so the silicon only gives half its output power. So if you've got a 24% efficient silicon cell, it'll only give 12% contribution to a two cell tandem. Three cells only give 8%. Four cells it only give 6%. So it's becoming less critical. And by that stage, you'd have enough confidence in these thin film materials that you're stacking onto silicon that you say, well, why do we need silicon anymore? So I think that, you know, that's my prognosis. If we can get stack cells on silicon to work, we'll transition quickly to an all thin film stack. Final bit, I'll just whiz through this. Uh, can solar power the world? Which is becoming an increasingly important question, particularly if we reach this terawatt level you know, in, over the next decade. So there's the sources of global CO2 emissions. So electricity generation, 38%. So that's addressing coal, getting coal out of electricity generation and gas, I guess. And then uh, transport is the next biggest, so that's electric vehicles and so on, powered by renewable energy. Um, 
Electricity generation is the easiest because even though it's 38% of emissions, electricity generation is only 3% of GDP. So it's sort of obscene, the amount of emission for the economic worth of the technology. Uh, this is just a report I've spoken about before from uh, LUT in um, Lapin Rinta University of Technology in Finland. But they project a very um, PV positive future with uh, over 60 terawatts of photovoltaics installed by 2050. So that would be averaging two terawatts a year from now on, which isn't out of the question if you can reach one terawatt this decade, two terawatts the next decade, and still going upwards, you'd probably get there. Um, and uh, the blue bit's wind. So a world dominated by photovoltaics and wind in their scenario. Um, so that was released two years ago. But this, this one was just released a couple of weeks ago by uh, ARENA, International Renewable Energy Association. Um, but they have a much more conservative um, outlook, even though PV is dominating the 2050 um, energy capacity and uh, electricity production. Uh, it's only 14 terawatts. So I'm just sort of thinking, you know, if you're going to get to one terawatt this decade, it's going to be very hard to keep the total capacity below 14 terawatts. I think we'll get there by um, 2035. So uh, it's a very um, conservative scenario. And they even have a large amount of fossil fuel retained with carbon capture and storage um, handling that. So, you know, it seems a little bit uh, out of touch with reality, uh, that report. Um, storage is going to be something that's needed. Grid already has plenty of storage. So this is New South Wales and that 2.8 gigawatts is showing the off peak hot water heating. So the total demand upon the grid is only about 10 gigawatts in New South Wales. So, you know, that's like 30% of capacity is, is stored and you can pump it into hot water all night if you want to, I guess. Well, you've got a few hours at least uh, at that type of storage of the whole grid capacity. And that was for coal generators, so you didn't have to switch them off over the night time. I don't think the, well, the coal generators were state owned at that era, so they didn't have to really pay for that. Um, so pumped hydro the other, is the other storage, and that was introduced mainly for nuclear. So this just shows Japan, which has an isolated grid, so have to balance everything. So as they install nuclear, which is a green line, <laughs> um, they were installing pumped hydro at about half the rate. So the pumped hydro is the right hand access and the nuclear is the left hand. So for every uh, two gigawatts of nuclear that went in, they were putting one giga of pumped hydro. That's so they could run the nuclear through the night, have a load for the nuclear at night time. So they just pump, put it into pumped hydro and then that got, energy got released during the daytime when the energy was needed. Um, so Andy Blakers and his group at ANU have been promoting off river pumped hydro. So this is a scheme in Italy that uh, at Bresenzano in Italy, it's one gigawatt and five gigawatt hour. So the top reservoir is the one on the left and it's, um, it's about 500 meters above the other one. So it stores five gigawatt hours of electricity. So that would be about half an hour of, UN, of New South Wales peak usage or about one hour of nighttime usage. So you might need, um, you know, 10 of these around the state or something to, you know, provide um, probably most of the storage you need. Andrew's found 600,000 around the world, 20,000 in Australia. So batteries is the other one, and this is a big 300 megawatt system that's going into uh, Victoria this year sometime, supposedly. So three times bigger than the big battery. And then the other big hope is uh, hydrogen. So you can do that with blue hydrogen where you use fossil fuels, but you bury the CO2. Or you can do it with green hydrogen, which sounds like a much better way. But that can uh, tackle all the difficult uh, energy uses that uh, electricity can't do that well. Uh, interestingly, it was interesting to see that a plant in Europe had um, produced steel with hydrogen for the first time. So sponge iron using um, hydrogen. So end of talk. Um, so photovoltaics to become insanely cheap, and I think that could well happen over this decade. Um, the PERC is accelerating a new era of photovoltaics, so all this 
triggering an interest in big modules and everything has just happened in concert with the introduction of PERC. So it's sort of been triggered, this uh, creative thinking by PERC. Um, so I think we'll see 10 cents a watt modules in the next few years and one cent a watt or $10 a megawatt hour uh, electricity prices. I still see that bid within the next few years, you know, certainly over this decade. And then by the end of the decade, we may well be at this one terawatt level that will contribute to mitigating global warming. So thanks for your attention. I went a little bit over time, but hopefully there's time for one or two questions. Thank you. Um, so I was going to say thank you, um, but there is time for questions. So if you'd like to, there's a microphone, if you'd like to either step up or just raise your hand. Um, I have a question while people are thinking. Uh, do we have a question over there? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, I'll, you want to come to the microphone and I'll ask okay. while we wait. Um, Martin, I wanted to ask you, given the growth in the industry, um, if you have a concept or an idea about what the research budget is for photovoltaics internationally. <sighs> Yeah, well, I think uh, companies like Longy have published figures. So if I remember right, it was 5% of their, I'm not sure, profit or turnover, probably profit, mm -hmm. <laughs> went into uh, to research. But uh, they have actually published their share. And First Solar publishes um, its research budget each year. So that's like, um, I'd say, 80 to 100 million a year um, First Solar is putting into research. So some of these other larger companies will be putting more in the net, so yeah, yeah. Thank you. quite substantial. Thanks for the talk, Martin. Um, I, my question is about metallization. So the rise of PERC has really been remarkable, particularly seeing that uh, Tongwei is up to 50 gigawatts. But if we go from 145 gigawatts to one terawatt of PERC per year, it's going to cause issues for silver usage. So I'm very interested to hear your take on how the metallization of PERC will evolve over the next five years to account for that. Yeah, no, that, no, that's a very good question. So I wrote a paper in 2011 and, and said, you know, silver was using about 10% of the world supply of PV was using about 10% of the supply of silver. And, but it, it has stayed um, reasonably constant since then. So it, it might have gone from 2,000 tonnes up to 3,000 being used for photovoltaics, despite the massive growth in the industry. So the industry has reacted by cutting back. But interestingly, the, that in that talk by Ryzen, I think it was on the heterojunctions, they have more of a problem with silver because they need a lot more. So with the recent skyrocketing in silver prices, not the time to be making heterojunctions. But um, they were talking about work that they were doing on um, copper metallization. And uh, you know, I had this picture of, of copper particles uh, that they were coating with silver so that you get the conductivity of copper but you get the coating with silver which makes the copper relatively inert. So uh, something like that might be a step and the heterojunction people uh, you know, having to face the problem earlier than the rest of the industry you know, may well develop a technology like that that takes off. So that's certainly one, one approach, just a flash of silver over the copper which, which is quite easy to do actually, you know, displacement placing, plating, you can do that quite simply. So that, um, that may be what happens. Although, you know, and going to these multiple bus bars and everything, that's really very substantially reducing the amount of silver as well. So, uh, yeah, and then of course, um, you know, we commercialized the buried contact solar cell technology in the 80s and uh, that didn't have any silver at all within the cell structure. And um, those modules were taken out after 20 years and the, um, the modules with the non-silver metallization were actually doing better than the modules with silver metallization at the end of that period. The other companies that had put in traditional modules at that period, the, the, the modules of nickel copper with a flash of silver over the top were doing better uh, in terms of their performance and, and uh, net degradation rate than the uh, standard technologies. So it is possible to, to use copper metallization, but you have to be you have to get things right. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to wind things up now. It's been a great presentation from Martin. So I'd like to ask you again, once again, to, to join me in thanking Martin for this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Martin.